You're very welcome. Um, so I think we can now move uh, to uh, uh, Stephen Shirley. Steve, we can see your slides. Okay, good. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you to Andreas and Andy and their teams for um, organizing this symposium and thanks for the chance to talk. I'm going to present um, a concept that I and my colleagues shown on this slide have been working on for some time that we're very excited about and we hope that you'll share our excitement. It's a collaboration between myself, uh, Zsuzsa Mark and Zabox Marco in the Physics Department at Columbia and then two former postdocs of mine, um, teams led by Andrew Mankarski in Victoria, University of Wellington and Katsumi Higaki who's at Tokyo University in Japan. Uh, and we recently put this concept and this work on the preprint um, server, so that's the link shown at the bottom there. So many of us have been studying this life cycle of this COVID-19 SARS-CoV-2 virus with more detail than we anticipated. Um, shown here is the life cycle that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, but showing um, a much more lipid-centric version of the life cycle. Um, and the concept that I'm going to present to you today is that lipid metabolism in particular may be a target for intervention in the um, SARS-CoV-2 life cycle and many other viruses, particularly envelope viruses. So I'm concentrating on mainly cholesterol metabolism and cholesterol um, participation in this life cycle, um, but it applies to several other lipids as well, particularly sphingolipids. So there appear to be two points of entry um, of the COVID uh, virus into the cell, an early viral entry dependent on the Tempras 2 protein, um, which associates with uh, cholesterol-rich microdomains of the plasma membrane and is then um, taken into the cell by pinocytosis. Um, there's also a late entry stage of entry, um, which is clathrin and caviolin and cothepsin dependent, which, is re which re represents a receptor-mediated endocytosis step. Both of those steps um, are very sensitive to the lipid environment of the plasma membrane and also of the lysosome, and particularly the cholesterol environment. Um, subsequently to that entry of the viral genome into the cell, um, that, that viral genome has to associate with a um, replication transcription complex, which seems to be scaffolded onto a double membrane vesicle, um, which appears to be derived from autophagy. Um, after that uh, transcription and translation takes place, the virus must be assembled, must be um, reconstituted into a lipid coat, and then export the cell by exocytosis. And as we heard last week, the end protein of the virus is also very um, sensitive to the lipid environment of the cell. So there are at least five different points representing pinocytosis, lysosomal function, autophagy, and exocytosis, exocytosis in the function of the envelope that are requiring um, recruitment of the host ability to utilize cholesterol in particular and other lipids. Um, I've, for some time, been working on a disease that will be the focus of my talk here, which is called Neiman Pick Type C. It's a monogenic neurodegenerative disease characterized by the accumulation of cholesterol in the lysosome. We've developed several model studies shown here for um, studying this disease, and our concept has always been to study um, the neurodegenerative disease and find a, a treatment for that disease. It's, this, it's a devastating pediatric um, disease. Most children die of this disease in their second decade. Um, shown here is basically the take home message of my um, talk. These are cells um, stained with a, a fluorescent dye for cholesterol. Um, and shown on the uh, normal panel is a normal set of fibroblasts stained with philippin, the cholesterol fluorescent dye, showing the standard pattern of cholesterol distribution within the cell. In the next panel is an NPC1 mutant. This is the uh, mutation in the gene responsible for Neiman Pick disease. And as you can see here, there's a massive accumulation of cholesterol in the lysosome of the cell. Of particular pertinence with my talk, um, we're, I, we are lucky enough to have a set of pharmacological compounds that mimic the NBC disease um, cell, and shown here is one compound, U1866A, where treat, normal cells have been treated with that drug and show an equivalent accumulation of cholesterol in the lysosome. And finally, of relevance to all of us at the moment, um, shown here on the last panel is a, a, a slide prepared by Katsumi Higaki showing the effect of chloroquine, um, the so-called wonder drug that everybody is being, um, probably not everybody, but many people are being uh, treated with in the clinic, um, showing an, an almost identical accumulation of cholesterol in the lysosome of the cell. Not very surprising because chloroquine is known to be a lysotromic agent, 
but it's very compelling that it shows exactly the same phenotype as do NPC1 mutants and induced NPC cells. So the point of my talk is that we can intervene pharmacologically at NPC1 as a possible anti-infective. This is the NPC1 protein. Um, it's found on the limiting membrane of the lysosome, and it's responsible for moving cholesterol as it comes in from the out outside of the cell, out of the lysosome, and redistributing it to the rest of the cell. The drugs that I'm going to tell you about bind to the so-called still sensing domain, these several drugs called U1866A, which I just showed you, imipropine, imipramine, and tranoconazole. All of these drugs and all of the defects in these genes show an accumulation, a lysosomal accumulation of a variety of lipids, but particularly cholesterol. We're lucky enough to have several um, animal models shown here as the mouse model that we use in the lab. And just to, by way of background, pig type C disease is an autosomal recessive fatal neurogenitor disease. It's a classical lysosomal storage disease, which, which results in a lipid accumulation in the lysosome. Two genes account for the disease, primarily mutations in MPC1, um, show cause this disease. Fortunately, the tertiary structure of both of these proteins has been solved with their ligands, so we know an awful lot about uh, the mechanism in which by this process takes place. So NPC1 is a, also, it turns out, is the lysosomal receptor for filoviruses, in particular Ebola, and it also seems to modulate the replication of multiple viruses, particularly enveloped viruses, including the SARS-CoV-1 virus and we presume SARS-CoV-2. We're lucky enough to have numerous conventional model systems. This gene is expressed in all cells of, of, of the body, um, and it's also found in almost every eukaryote that's been sequenced. And so these model systems are very readily available to us, and we've been using many of them. There's also um, the ability to pharmacologically induce a neumon pick like phenotype. Shown here are two compounds which we're very excited about, U1866A, which I just showed you about, and its corresponding accumulation of cholesterol in the lysosome, and imipramine a similar uh, compound that also produces exactly the same phenotype as you see in NPC1 mutant cells. Um, this structure of this protein, this NPC1 protein, has been solved by cryo-EM, and cholesterol and U1866A and imip imipramine all bind to exactly the same position on the molecule and actually probably competitively inhibit each other's action. So NPC1 deficiency is not just a neurodegenerative lipidosis then. It looks like it's involved in the life cycle of several viruses, particularly enveloped viruses, and that includes filoviruses such as Ebola, the coronavirus, and even the retroviruses. So how can we um, exploit this observation to come up with a therapy? So shown here is the same lipid cycle, showing now the position of the MPC1 protein found on the limiting membrane of the lysosome. An inhibition of this membrane is going to affect every one of these cholesterol homeostatic steps by, by lowering down the levels of the cholesterol that's available to the cell. So inhibition of NPC1 or genetic mutation in NPC1 results in a denudation of cholesterol at the plasma membrane, and therefore a reduction in the number of, plasma, of cholesterol single lipid rafts at the plasma membrane. That then would reduce infectivity at the very first and possibly at the later stages of viral entry. The accumulation of cholesterol in the lysosome causes a um, inhibition of the cathepsins that are involved in priming of the S protein for its ability to release the viral genome into the cell. The accumulation of cholesterol in the lysosome in neumopic mimic cells also reduces autophagy. And under those circumstances, this double membrane vesicle would also be reduced. And the absence of cholesterol to participate in the export of the virus from the cell will, would be predicted to change the ability of that virus to recruit lipids and therefore be exported by exocytosis, and also the activity of proteins like the end, end protein, as we heard last week. So fortunately, um, this is not just a uh, hypothetical situation. There are many drugs that are available that have been approved for use in various other um, uh, syndromes that also inhibit NPC1. Shown here are a set of inhibitors that we have been working on for some time that are widely available and um, have been FDA approved. U1866A never made it into the clinic, but it is the drug that has been used most, character, most readily to show that inhibiting the MC1 pathway inhibits all of these viruses, including coronaviruses. Imipramine has also been shown to inhibit a series of envelope viruses, has not actually been tested for coronavirus, but the assumption is since it binds the same site as U1866A, it would have that same effect. And as you can see here, these other molecules, cefiranthine, 
etronconazole and pozonazole all bind to the, exactly the same groove of NPC1 and have been shown to inhibit a variety of, N, of viruses, including coronaviruses and particularly SARS-CoV-1. A similar strategy could also be taken to um, mimic NPC1 disease, not directly to inhibit the NPC1 protein, but to simulate the cell's response and therefore accumulate cholesterol in the lysosome. And that's shown here. One of the best examples of that is actually chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, and azithromycin. All of those drugs, as well as having other effects on the cell, obviously inhibit viruses and also result in accumulation of cholesterol um, at the lysosome and late endosome, increasing the pH, inhibiting autophagy, and therefore changing the cholesterol status of the cell. And some of these other drugs, chloroquine, haloperidol, and amiodarone, um, also shows similar effects on the late endocytic pathway. So um, we're at the stage of, of really proselytizing the use of these drugs as being worthy of further research. Um, there are many things to be determined. Of course, the main um, question is whether these NPC inhibitors and mimetics could translate into COVID-19 antivirals. Um, we have, we're usually utilizing urine models um, and with, together with the markers in the physics department, we're using quantitative rodent behavior to assess whether these drugs might actually produce a phenotype in, the mouse mo in a mouse model. It's very interesting that, as I said, there are numerous animal models available for this disease, particularly there's a very um, well-studied cat model of, of Neiman Pick disease. And it was Steve, interesting to see- That's your one Mark. Okay, nearly done, thanks. Um, it's very interesting to note that uh, cats look like might, they might be able to be infected with the coronavirus. And so it would be very straightforward to test this hypothesis in the CAP model, subject to the usual um, institutional review boards. And finally, of course, we would be very excited to participate in any clinical trial that leads to implementation, or at least testing the implementation of these um, generically available drugs. Finally, an obvious genetic experiment um, presents itself as whether this um, heterozygosity at this locus might be an advantage in human populations. Um, particularly, does variation in the MPC1 protein confer any protection to COVID-19? And most specifically, does heterozygosity at the MPC1 locus confer protection? Um, and finally, of course, there are at least 50 lysosomal storage disorders that, can, that, that are um, studied widely um, in the human population. And the question there would be, heter would heterozygosity for 50 lysosomes, any one of those other loci, confer protection to the COVID-19 virus? And we recently have um, been uh, negotiating with the IRB board to get that study initiated. And we're very close on that. Um, I'm happy to answer questions. The contact information at the bottom of the slide there. I, I just put, thought I'd leave up this, I think, very compelling image, considering how much chloroquine is being used in the um, clinic at the moment to show that you know, maybe cholesterol homeostasis is a good target for intervention in COVID-19. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Steve. And, uh, you know, let's try to keep both the question and the answer uh, short. There's quite a number of them. Um, I, I have a quick question. So it's sure. the, the, the effects of chloroquine has actually been a little bit controversial. There, there isn't a clear indication that it actually helps with the disease. Um, so so do, you, do you have examples of clear antiviral replication effect or antiviral in, in, in incorporation in the cell effects? Uh, by the uh, other drugs that you have mentioned? So every one of the drugs that I picked out um, have been shown to have antiviral activity, um, in vitro, of course. Um, in fact, in, one, in some cases, they've been shown in vivo. Genetic um, heterozygosity in the mouse model for um, Ebola was shown to give protection as well. So the target certainly gives protection in animal models. Um, I don't know what the status of with, was with Ebola in terms of whether these drugs ever made it into a clinic for studying Ebola. I think maybe the, the disease never got to that stage of being treated with these drugs. Um, but you. now, of course, we have the possibility to, to test them a bit more. Well, so Martin, Mar Martin Markowitz? Yes, hi. Um, good morning, and thank you for your presentation. Um, I just had a question about the um, concentration of drugs that are required in vitro to exert the effect and whether or not these concentrations are achievable in vivo. Um, the chloroquine concentration was 10 micromolar, which is quite high. Yep. And generally speaking, in drug development, we like to see drugs active at nanomolar and sub-nanomolar concentrations. No, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, these, the, the, our studies started with using these drugs as research tools. 
Um, and that's how we actually just, you know, not we, but other people discovered the U18 drug and, and imipramine. Um, so yes, they used at concentrations that, that probably would not be achievable in the clinic. Um, that said, you can titrate down to um, the nanomolar level and still get an effect on sterile homeostasis. And finally, of course, you know, the, the, the way these drugs might work is to starve the style of cholesterol. 50% um, of the population of the US is on a statin. If you were to combine a statin with a drug that inhibits pick disease, you would have a very effective, possibly at a lower, lower dosage, of depriving the cell of cholesterol and therefore affecting this pathway. And so I think what we would envisage is actually a synergistic effect of these drugs and therefore you could lose at low, use a lower concentration. Um, but that's of course one thing that we want to do with our animal models and find out whether we can actually um, produce an effect at, at um, sensible concentrations. Good point. Thank you. Uh, Ira? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Steve. Great talk. Um, Thanks, I have a, a, a quick comment and a quick question. The comment is, I've also thought about heterozygous lysosomal storage diseases. And of course, these are rich in the Ashkenazi population. Absolutely. And it'll be interesting when the geneticists uh, analyze the data to see if that population with, for example, heterozygous Tay-Sachs and others um, uh, are protected from progression of disease. So I think that that's a really interesting genetic experiment. Okay. Uh, my question is, is as you well know, uh, cholesterol trafficking is very important uh, to maintain immune cell function. Yep. And so is it possible that a side effect, uh, an adverse effect of this would be to compromise those defense? Yeah, I think I actually saw an interesting study last night where 25-hydroxycholesterol is involved in the innate immune response. And, um, you know, all of these derivatives of cholesterol would accumulate to different extents and have been shown to accumulate in, in pick disease. And so obviously with any target, there are going to be side effects. Um, my hope would be that particularly as heterozygotes of um, this disease, pick disease, are asymptomatic. They have very little evidence for any neurological disease or any issue with, um, uh, you know, any immunogenic um, problems. And in fact, as you showed, they actually may be resistant to atherosclerosis because of that deprivation of cholesterol. So at 50% lower levels of the protein, you get a biochemical phenotype, but no apparent symptoms of, of diseases that have been reported. And so based on that, you can reduce the level of the protein by 50%, affect the cholesterol homeostatic pathway, but not have any symptoms. So my hope would be that, that that's you know, a reason for it being a good target. And I think most drug developers look for that effect at heterozygosity as being an important 